This morning, I'm going to share a few words with you from God's Word regarding the subject of coming unto or into the order of sonship. There, is, there has been much teaching in recent years or in past years relative to this revival that we're living in as to what is sonship. What's the difference of being a son of God by m virtue of our birth, new birth, or coming into that place called sonship? And I observe that uh, the folks here in this tabernacle are very free to speak about uh, sons of God and sonship. This is not true in most churches. They're afraid to use that terminology because they've heard that there's been some abuse or they've heard some fanaticism relative to this or some feel that, that we wouldn't dare think that there's another realm of development in the Lord that helps us or we should attain unto. But perhaps I can share a few words from God's Word the way uh, I have been seeing this knowledge. I'm sure you have gleaned already this week that I believe in maturity. I believe that it's possible to grow. You that heard me speak day after day have heard me emphasizing over and over again that when we're born again, we're only born as a babe in Christ, as a young Christian, and we're destined to mature. We're destined to come unto the likeness of Jesus Christ. We ought to know this. We ought to believe this. I believe that we ought to know our relationship with God. I believe that we ought to know that we're more than merely a Christian in as much as we belong to the family of God. I believe we ought to know that God is our Father. And I believe that we ought to know that we are one of His sons. I tell you, when you know that God is your Father and you know you're one of His sons, you have special authorities, special authority and privileges that other people don't have. If you're not certain that you are related to the Father, God, as a son, then you have to always approach him cautiously. You have to ask him apologetically or cautiously. And you cannot really do his works with authority. You're going to hope that he might uh, back you up. But if you really know you belong to him as a son, and he is a father to you, then you are able to do his works in a purity, honesty, and a true authority. Amen. And I hope this morning I can somehow impart a word of encouragement to you to give you that feeling of knowing you belong, that you're not merely just a guest in the family of God or that you just happen to have been uh, born in the family of God and you hope he's with you. Let's read from the scriptures, St. John chapter 1 and at verse 12 and verse 13. I'll read those two verses to start. But just before I read them, I'm just going to bow my head and close my eyes. I'm going to ask God to give us the wisdom and the spiritual guidance we need. May we pray. Our Father, we look to Thee this day that You would impart to us the word of life. For here we are. We're people that take Your name. We call ourselves Christian, which means we have Christ in us. And we read in Your Word that You have called us to be Your children and literally to know that we are your sons and that you are our Father. So we ask this morning, impart to us an understanding that we may know what your word teaches relative to this subject and we'll give you the honor and glory for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Beginning at verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This verse implies that God gave us the power, or another word for that word power could be authority. He gave us the authority and enablement to become sons of God. Someone says, well, weren't you a son the moment you were saved? Yes, you were, by virtue of the new birth. You have been born into the family of God, and you have been destined to become uh, the son of God, even as Jesus, when he was a baby, born of the Virgin Mary. He was at that moment the son of God. But as far as the world was concerned, they didn't benefit from that 
uh, aspect of his life, did they? No. Not as, as the, if he'd only been born as a baby and remained a baby and died at the age of one half year old or died at the age of one year old, uh, the world would have never seen the benefit or the effect of the Son of God that God sent to the world. Although he was the Emmanuel at the moment he was born. He was Jesus. He was God with us. But he would not have fulfilled the effect or the effect that he was to fulfill as the Son of God, not until he came into that place of maturity that he was spoken to by, spoken to the people by the Father when the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God spoke to the people there through an audible verse, voice while he was being baptized in the River Jordan. And from that moment on, he went forth and did the works of God as a matured son of God, representing the life of God, the will of God, the purpose of God, the Father. I believe that God wants the Christian church, the Christian believers, to have that feeling of knowing that they also are destined to come into a place of, of service, a place of maturity, a place of usefulness, a place of fruitfulness. For in your early Christian experience, you don't have the enablement or the ability, the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding to work the works of the Father, primarily because you were merely just born and you're new in the family of God. It is new to you and we need to learn. We need to go through tests. We must grow. We must have trials. Trials are essential and important. And tonight I'm going to give you a message relative to how God is perfecting the church and bringing to pass his kingdom through the baptism of fire that's coming forth upon the earth. Let me read another verse to you found in Romans chapter 8 that bears out this thought. Keep in mind that God did give us the authority to become sons of God, those of us that have been born into the family of God. Now, a lot of Christians are not taught this. I'm sure you know this, that many Christians are taught just to be thankful they got saved. Just be thankful you're born. And just be content the way you've been or the way you are. Just do your best to obey God's commands. And someday when Jesus returns, things are going to be different. But as one of God's children, one of God's ministers and teachers, I have the responsibility to challenge you, to encourage you, to desire, to grow, to desire to become. Become that what you are not at present. Even though you're a believer in Christ, even though you're a Christian today, God has in mind to cause us to change some more and mature into a place of effective witness, effective life, really becoming a true example of the kingdom of God. Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. There's a ceremony that the Jewish people uphold that the child, the young boy, that's born into a household in a Jewish family, goes through a ceremony known as Bar Mitzvah. This ceremony, Bar Mitzvah, is an adoption ceremony, a transfer. There's a change over. A little Jewish boy, he's a son in that family, in that household, the day he was born. But he does not come into a place of uh, authority until he is the responsibility of his father. Up until he is 12 years old, according to Jewish tradition, the little boy is under the responsibility completely of the mother. The mother is responsible to care for that little boy. And the mother must guide it, lead it. Of course, there's a 
father in the home to direct the 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 uh, the life of the child but the boy is not really the responsibility of the father until he goes through this bar mitzvah ceremony and there's a church meeting of this nature whereby the rabbi the the minister will lay his hands on him and and dedicate him and the whole church witnesses this and from then on at the age of either 12 or 13 in that area there he is he is the responsibility of the father i believe this is why we have it recorded in god's word the place where jesus was 12 years old when they were in the city of jerusalem and and when mary and joseph were on their way home on their way out they discovered that their son was not with them they said where is jesus and they could not find him in their midst and they had to go back to the city and they located him with the scribes and the teachers and when they asked him how come jesus you remain here why didn't you come with us and then he made the statement know ye not that i must be about my father's business i like that of course he knew that his heavenly father was his true father he knew his identity he knew that he was a son of god and he was eager to know god's business his father's business and so to find out his father's business he wanted to study the word of god the holy scriptures he had to study and learn at the feet of the teachers and and speak to them and ask questions he was about his father's business now some christians think they will never come to that place they think it's none of their business to have god the father uh, teach them his ways they think it's only their business to ever go to church all their lifetime and pay their tithes and offerings and just hear a sunday school lesson sing some hymns and that's the way they're going to be all their lifetime shame on us god has called us to come into a place of usefulness and fruitfulness he, he's called us to move into a place of effective witness and life to the world that we live in most of us know that we don't have talents and gifts to do god's work we know that no young christian naturally has special endowments of the spirit of wisdom the spirit of the knowledge of god and the spirit of his graces uh, to the degree that we can honestly manifest the will of the father on this earth we need to come together we need to be taught the word of the lord in church services we need to be ex ex encouraged and exhorted to to uh, be built up in the faith and be admonished to be a witness on the job where we're at work when you meet a crisis in someone else's life we need to be exhorted to to bless that that situation help those people in that crisis hour you do something about it you bless them you heal them in the name of jesus you have the authority as a believer in christ we're exhorted in a true spiritual church to receive strength spiritual strength to become that what we read jesus was do you believe this is possible do you believe that god made provision to enable us to become what jesus was what did god give us to make this possible he gave us the holy spirit the holy ghost that's why the bible says but you shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you what kind of power would you get you would get god's power to enable you to become like the lord would have you be like jesus was jesus according to the scriptures is an elder brother to us we're in the same family he's a savior of our soul true and he's also as an elder brother in the family of god we're also brothers to him in as much as we have the same spirit and god the father intends for us to be interested in the father's business i'm glad you're here this morning this is an indication that you are interested in god's business in the father's business you do want to be strengthened you do want to be encouraged you do want to be challenged you do expect to be more effective for god in the future than what you've been in the past i expect to be more effective in the future for i also am growing even though i'm a minister and a teacher and i'm supposed to already be fruitful and effective but i must do what i'm called to do and do it faithfully and i know that god will enable me to accomplish even greater for the glory of god for i discover that the only way i can improve is to be involved let me read some verses to back that up 
in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, and verse 13 and 14. Hebrews 5, oh, let me start at verse 11. Hebrews 5, verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Do you know what that tells me? This tells me that you can become skillful in the use of milk. Of course, the Word of God, the Scriptures themselves, the, the, the Bible verses and chapters, you can study them and you can go to a Bible school and learn all about the history, the traditions, the doctrines, theology. You can be skillful with milk but still be only a babe and remain a babe. You can have even doctorate degrees in your theology, have a whole row of degrees, but you're still only a babe and you're still unskillful in the word of righteousness. The only way you become skillful in the word of righteousness is to have your senses exercised. How many know you have five senses? You have the sense of hearing, smelling, seeing, tasting, and feeling. And the only way you're going to get these senses exercised to discern both good and evil, you've got to get involved with other people. Amen. It's not a matter of just starting out of a book and, and then passing a test and getting a hundred and an A and say, look, now I pass all my tests, now I get a degree. No, no. You must, to become skillful in the word of righteousness, in the word of righteousness. With what you speak, you can only come to a place of true effectiveness after you've gone through experience. You've been exposed to the problem. You've been exposed to the enemy. And as a result, you see the power of God. You exposed yourself by giving the knowledge that you do have to someone, and perhaps that someone disagreed with you. Or perhaps they didn't uh, accept it like you thought they would. And as such, they resist you. And all of a sudden, your senses are being exercised to discern good and evil. And it's not pleasant to have your senses disturbed, is it? You like your senses pleased. You, you like everybody to think only well of you. But if everybody would only think beautiful and well of you, then your senses wouldn't be exercised. They'd be pampered, you know. You'd be just being patted and smoothed back, over, and, and you've been all, they'd always be having the fur uh, just patted the one direction all the time. Pretty. But God wants you to have the fur uh, patted the opposite direction, you know. So your senses can get exercised to discern both not only good, but also evil. For if you can take it both directions, then you're going to become skillful in the word of righteousness. This is the only way you can become skillful in the word of righteousness. You must expose yourself. Some people say, well, if only I could be a good speaker like Pastor Mitchell or like Brother Durstein or Brother Farmer. And then once once I become a good speaker, then I'm going to start witnessing. I'm going to start doing things. No, no. Don't think that way. If you're a believer and you have Christ in your life and you know you're a Christian, you have a right to start the way you are. You need to start the way you are so that you can have your senses exercised. Because only by having your senses exercised can you mature properly the way God wants you to mature. And some say, well, I'm going to wait another 10 years yet before I ever tell anybody I'm a Christian because I want to study the Bible real well and I want to be able to speak very well and fluently and then I'm going to be a witness. I'm going to tell somebody, but it's going to be at least five years yet. Well, you'll never come to the place where you'll feel that you can really be effective for if you do go in that thought, then you go in the, in the spirit of your own personal pride. You're not trusting God and you're going to get in trouble. And when you go thinking you know all about it, how to do it, you're going to get a big letdown. Of course, that, that time when you do it, That'll be helpful to you, too. Your senses will be exercised, but sometimes we get such a big letdown, such a terrific fall, we can never get up again. And we may give up at that moment and say, look, I can't do this, I give up, because the fall was too great. But for you to become skillful in the word of righteousness, it is essential that we be involved. It is essential that you remain close to other believers and Christians. Don't think for a moment that this gives you license 
to leave the fellowship of the body, the local church. Not at all. If there's ever a time you need the fellowship of the local body, it's when you become uh, involved with other people, having your senses exercised, because you're going to have the fur rubbed the wrong direction many times. But as such, when you come back into the local church and share your testimony, you discover other people are having the same experience, and that you're not the only one that that has made some mistakes or had some great blessings, but you hear the testimonies of different ones and you see how their experience in life is similar to yours. And this strengthens you. This helps you to want to continue on and be faithful. But some people say, look, I really got a revelation from God. I know that God called me to be one of his sons. No longer a servant. Now I'm a son. And so this means God has really uh, brought me to a higher elevation in the spirit. And now there's no need for me to become uh, kind of around these church people. I can stay home and get my directions from God the Father, and he guides me, and he leads me, and he tells me what to do, when to do it, for I'm one of his sons. Some people become so high in the spirit as a son, they say, well, they don't even have to read the Bible anymore because God the Father gives them direction uh, directly by his spirit, tells them where to go, how to go, what to do, and how to do it. And so that far as the Bible is concerned, that's just for the babes, you know, that have to find out about God. But now I found God, and he's my father, I'm one of his sons. Beware of that thinking. That, that's subtle that Satan will use to try to get you ultra-spiritual, ultra-mystic. And without the word, you become impractical. In other words, without the word of God, you lose your effectiveness for your fellow man. If you're a genuine son of God like Jesus was, you'll always have your feet on the ground. Amen. You need them on the ground so that you can help the people on the ground where the problem is. Amen. But when you're spiritually proud, you'll come to the place where you say, well, there's no need to pray anymore, at least not much. No need to, uh, to read the scriptures anymore because I know God is my father. I believe he called me as one of his sons and I'm one of his favorites, you know. Well, at least he blessed me much. And so I need no longer become involved with these uh, lower level Christians. And as a result, you find yourself standing alone. And you stand alone, and lo and behold, because you're no longer involved much with people, you don't have your senses exercised anymore. As such, you become unskillful in the word of righteousness. You lose the joy. You lose the, the glory and the blessing of victories. Because to have a victory, you must have a battle. And to have a battle, you must become involved. You need people. How many know that? You know, some people say, well, I, I, uh, I've had a marvelous victory last year. What a blessing it was. But I didn't have a victory for a long time. Well, the reason is we've not perhaps been in any battles lately. Well, maybe you've gotten so highly elevated in the spirit and so close to the Father that you just haven't been around people anymore. And to get involved or everybody's thinking the way you think they should think. Let me share a verse also in Galatians chapter 4 that we should understand about this subject he says we begin as as servants now i say that the heir as long as he is a child differeth nothing from a servant though he be lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father even so we when we were children were in bondage under the elements of the world but when the fullness of the time was come god sent forth a son made of a woman under the law to redeem them which were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons here's that thought that god does intend for us to come unto a definite adoption and i believe that we can know that we've entered into that place of of uh, effectiveness and fruitfulness as sonship would would have us be we should understand that god did call us to be his sons now i want to share something with you how you can make this become a reality? How can I uh, bring this to pass? In other words, I know I'm a Christian, and I know that God called me to be a son, but how can I establish this fact? Because I sometimes question whether I'm really one of God's sons. I remember in the natural. My name is Gerald Durstein, and I remember in, the, in my early years, sometimes... I wouldn't be treated so nice in my home. I had two brothers, and I think mom and dad were favoring either my older brother or my younger brother above me. 
And it always seemed like I'd get the raw deal. I was in the middle, you know, and, and sometimes I'd get a f- feeling I don't even believe I belong to this family. I believe I was just plain, perhaps they adopted me. I'm not a true Durstein. And, uh, well, anyway, I got to first grade in school and discovered the teachers always asked you, what is your name? So I said, my name is Gerald Durstein. Uh, that's what my parents said, anyhow. I, I mean, I assumed that's true. But there would be times and days that I'd wonder about that. I don't know about you, but especially when you feel sorry for yourself. As a young person and you get a raw deal and something in the family, you begin to wonder, you know, I, I wonder if I really belong here. They're just using me. And, but I found myself always signing my name the same. When the teacher said, put your name on the upper right-hand corner and pass the papers to the front, I'd always put that same name there, Gerald Durstein. I never put Sam Smith or Tom Jones on that paper. And then when they would ever ask me the question, uh, what is your name? I found myself always saying Gerald Durstein, even though I must admit sometimes I wondered about it. I questioned it, but I would always say the same thing. I would always say I'm Gerald. I would always say that, and I'd always write my name as such. I never changed it. It was always the same. And I assure you that today I have no doubts whatsoever. It is established now. But in my younger years, as a young person, as a child, sometimes I'd wonder about it. Now, I learned something through this. On the same, on the same way as I received my true identity in the physical through a continual acknowledgement of claiming this is who I am because I was told I was this person. Now it's settled. I feel good about it. No question at all that I belong to the Durstein family and my first name is Gerald and I was born in this household. How do you come to this identification as a son of God on the same order you do? When the scriptures say that you're called to be a son of, the, of God, you have a right to thank the Lord for this fact, that God is your father and that you are one of his sons. I don't know, have you ever said that to anyone? Have you ever actually said it that way, that God is my father and that I'm one of his sons? You know, something inside of you doesn't want you to say that. Something inside of you says, well, look, just be satisfied that you're a Christian. Just be satisfied that you are one of his children. I'll tell you why it's important that this become established, that you are one of his sons. In Minnesota, we have a Christian campground. It's called Christian Retreat Campgrounds. Beautiful place. We have 35 acres, a nice tabernacle and motel rooms and cottages and place for campers and trailers and tents along a lovely lake called Strawberry Lake. Hope sometime you folks will come and visit with us there in the summer. We have 10 weeks of continuous meetings. I live there. It's not very far from here, only a few miles over the hill, uh, this direction, I believe. And anyway, uh, there's a certain house right next to our campground. Right next to our campground. It's a special house. I can go to that house. I don't own it. It's not mine. I don't own that house belongs to somebody else. But I can go to that house and I can walk up to the door and walk right in. And the owners of that house won't mind. But they would mind if you'd walk in. But they'll let me walk right into that house. Not only that, but when I get into the kitchen, there's another special door in that kitchen that I would have the right, and I do it, to open it up and look inside and take out a nice piece of pie and I could actually eat it. I don't have to ask anybody if I may have it or not. In fact, it would make those owners feel real happy if I would do it. Do that. But don't you try it. No. You wouldn't, you'd embarrass those people and embarrass yourself. You might even get in trouble if you would try it. But why could I do it? Do you know why? Because there's a relationship factor there that has been settled. Oh, you guessed it. It's the home of my father and my mother. They know I'm their son. And I happen to know that too. And this gives me special privileges in that home that you don't have. Of course, you have your father and mother's home that you can go to, I can't go to. 
But this is why it's so important that this matter be settled between you and God, that you know that you are one of his sons. Why? Because when you meet a sick person or someone that needs help from God, you feel that this is what you're here for. You say, well, I'm one of God's people, one of his sons, and in the name of Jesus, you can put your hand on them and pray and expect Father to do his work because you're his son. You belong. But if you're not too sure that you're his son, then you better call up the pastor or call up somebody else or do something different because of, because of your fear, uncertainty, and doubt or unbelief, I suppose nothing will happen. But if you can know and believe that God is with you and that you are with him, then something will happen. This is what I call sonship. Coming to that place of authority because of your true identity, having the identity settled knowing that he, you are one of his sons, he is your father. Isn't that lovely? But isn't it true that many of us are a little timid when it comes to doing God's works? Well, we say, well, I haven't been a Christian long enough yet. Or we say, well, I just don't know enough Bible verses. Oh, I haven't gone to Bible school. So how can I do his works? And you think of all kinds of ideas why you can't do his works. But I'm teaching you this morning that God makes it possible for you to mature into this place by availing yourself of his spirit that he gave you and as the scripture teaches be faithful to acknowledge with your lips the same thing that caused you to become a christian that if you confess with your mouth the lord jesus and believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth your confession is made unto salvation and you have a right to acknowledge with your lips that you are his son he is your father. Thank him for this daily. Thank him for it. Acknowledge it. Don't be afraid to, to speak it to other people. But then, secondly, to, to confirm this, that you are one of his sons, you better act like one of his sons. Amen. I mean by that, you're going to do his works then. Yeah. You're going to bless other people. You will pray for other people. You will assist other people. And your life will be measured and be identified similar to the life of Jesus. You won't do things that you're sure Jesus didn't do. You'll want to do what you feel Jesus did do because you're happy you're one of his brothers and that God is your father and you belong to the same family. Are you still here? I believe that God wants us to come into this relationship and identity as sons and not just be, be flimsy, uh, just ordinary you know, people that call themselves religious or Christians. Only, they say, well, I belong to so-and-so church, and I go at least once a week or twice a week, and, well, you know, my vocation is I'm a carpenter, I'm a farmer, I'm this or I'm that, but you never have any intentions of ever becoming more fruitful and useful for God. You're sick if you're that way. There's something wrong with you. If you're a normal Christian, you'll appropriate the Spirit of God who has come into your life and desire to avail yourself of the glorious power and life that God has given to you. But we must begin to think properly. We must begin to believe properly. We must know that we're destined to mature and that God is bringing us into this place known as sonship. I believe that according to Revelation 12, the Bible speaks of a church in the last day that shall bring forth a people that will be masculine in nature, they're going to be as sons of God. I believe that the majority of the religious people are satisfied just belonging to an organization. And uh, they belong to the mother as such. The mother kind of cuddles them, gives them a knowledge of how to be saved or find God. But the Bible speaks of in the last days, there's going to come forth another uh, masculine child. The enemy's going to hate immensely. The devil will hate you for attempting to begin to work the works of Christ. Nevertheless, I believe that these people shall come forth with understanding and new authority yeah. and God will anoint you and bless you for your faith and he'll, he'll use you. But if you refuse to believe it, then you'll have to be that mother that's going to be chased and so forth. I believe that God wants us to know we're called to be his sons. Can you believe that? But beware of this. Don't ever get that high-minded attitude 
like I've heard some people say, well, now I'm no longer a servant. I'm a son. And they kind of feel like they're an exclusive people. Here's the danger of this uh, when you think of yourself being a little bit more spiritual because of an experience that God gave you. They say, well, I'm not a servant anymore. I'm a son. Therefore, since I'm a son, God don't expect me to do any of these menial tasks. In other words, uh, God will just tell me all of a sudden what to do. I need not do anything as far as personal effort is concerned. When God speaks, then I'll do it. And in the meantime, I'll just be uh, waiting around till God gives me my next direction. Uh, while, while you, you that want to be missionaries, I, we, we have some people in Florida like this. Uh, they claim they came into a high sonship position and no longer do they believe in missionary activity. Because to be a missionary means you're going in your own strength and you're trying to teach people about Christ and all you're doing is just the, the duties of a servant. In other words, you're going out as a worker in your own strength. But someday you'll get the light and you'll come into sonship and God's just holding you and preparing you for a great day that's to come when he's going to really use you. But I found some of those people have been sitting around for some years now and they lost their joy, they lost their victory, they went back to their old habits again, and some lost their faith completely in God. And this is a dangerous thing. Beware of this. It's a subtle thing. It seems spiritual. And you have some teachers come into your homes or these home prayer meetings and they come as real ministers of what they call deep teaching, really deep, you know, and it's very mystically psychic, and of course you all want to grow, and they say, God has given us an understanding that we're to be so enraptured with his presence that we are only led by his spirit. Whenever he tells us to move, then we move. And usually uh, those people also say that a church doesn't help you very much because there's too many carnal people in the church, and you get your best leadings at home. In other words, let the Lord direct you, and you don't have to go to church regularly anyway. Only if the Spirit tells you to go. Usually, usually that Spirit don't let you go to churches. Uh, usually. Uh, that Spirit usually says you're tired in the morning, you're kind of sleepy and weary, and that Spirit usually tells you that there's a lot of carnal Christians over there, and why get involved with them? That Spirit usually kind of lets you feel pretty comfortable just the way you are. And that's the Spirit of Satan. It's a false spirit. We've had that in Sarasota, and you're going to be approached by these spirits the same way Amen. through nice teachers that come along that seem to have a beautiful word, and, but they don't belong. They don't belong to any group. You ask, oh, who, are they? who knows you? Well, well, God called them out. They called them out of Babylon, they said many years ago, but nobody knows them. Beware of those kind of teachers and ministers that nobody knows them. The, they, nobody knows them because they don't fit in the body of Christ. There's nobody that can know them because they refuse to let them know because they're misfits as far as God is concerned. And, and they're bringing confusion and they're false teachers. And you'll have those. I don't know if you ever had any in this part of the country or not. But we do have them in America, I know. But let's be careful and go forth in the power of his might. And let's believe that the closer we get to God the Father spiritually, the more like a human adult we'll be. We'll love the babies. We'll love the children. We'll love the teenagers. And we'll love the adults. Amen. And we'll want to be involved with them all. Yeah. I find even grandmas and grandpas, they like children too, don't they? I even found grandmothers like babies. They like grandchildren, don't they? And grandpas like grandchildren. And so why wouldn't it be that way in the Lord? Amen. If you're closer to God and more spiritual and have come into a higher order in the Lord, why wouldn't you like the baby Christians and love to be around them and nurture them and help them? Why wouldn't you also have a fatherly spirit if you come close to the Father? A fatherly spirit is a spirit that wants to help all people, the young ones, the middle-aged ones, and you will not seclude yourself from the rest of the church. You feel that you owe the church an obligation because of your closeness to the Father and your higher realm of attaining in the things of the Spirit. This is what I call sonship, and the manifested sons are those people that are faithful to the Word of God and when they work the Word of God, God works in their behalf. A miracle may happen, a healing may happen, and when the Spirit of God flows through you, that's a manifested Son. It's Jesus flowing through you. But you know, I can be a manifested Son of God one moment and be a manifested Son of Willis Durstein. That's my father's name, Willis Durstein. I'm Gerald Durstein. I'm both human and I also have the Spirit of God in me, the, the Divine Spirit. So even though there's moments I manifest the Son of God, as you ever hear the Manifested Sons Company? Uh, well, uh, 
uh, when I pray for a sick person and that sick person is healed, I'm of the Manifested Sons Company. Praise God. And when I preach the Word of God and you're healed and blessed and, and encouraged, I'm of the Manifested Sons. That, that means Christ is flowing through me and the Son of God is being manifested. But when I go home and eat my lunch, I'm Gerald Durstein. I'm a mani manifested son of Willis Durstein that lives in northern Minnesota at that time. I'm only a manifested son when the Son of God, Christ himself, is functioning in a direct manner. I don't claim to be of a special company that belongs in a certain suite in a certain hotel, and, and that's where I live. And if you come there, you just might become a member of the same manifested son company. No, no. Uh, the, the sons of God are genuinely sons of God when the Son of God himself is functioning through you. And since we're still human, we're going to have the natural life that's going to be manifested at times when you get hungry and when you have natural things to take care of, even though you have the Spirit of Christ in you. But the manifested sonship life is only when Christ himself is doing his work you the vessel, praise God. And so I will not glory in anything else but the fact that God is my Father, I am one of his children, I am a Christian, called to be a son. Lord, may I be faithful to do your will and works. hope you have enjoyed this message and that it has enriched your life. If you would like to see our entire list of life-building messages by various Holy Spirit-inspired speakers, go to the Video Sermon tab on our Free Bible Study Lessons website. That is www.freebiblestudylessons.com. May God richly bless you as you study His Word.